a lesson for June 28, 2015. Lesson 4. It is taken from Unit 1, which is titled, Amos Rails Against Injustice. Our lesson for the day is t entitled, So Done With You. Our devotional reading is taken from the book of Hosea, chapter 11, verses 1 through 7. Our background scripture is from the book of Amos, chapter 8. And our printed text is from Amos, the 8th chapter, verses 1 through 6, and verses 9 and 10. And our key verse... He said, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, A basket of summer fruit. Then said the Lord unto me, The end is come upon my people of Israel. I will not pass by, by them any more. Amos 8 2. So done with you. Amos, who names me to bear a load, was burdened over the sins of the northern kingdom in the 8th century B.C. Whereas Hosea was crushed with a sense of the unfaithfulness of them to the love of God, Amos was outraged at the violence they had done to the justice and righteousness of God. The theme of Amos is the judgment of sin. One of the reasons why sinners defer or are slow to repent is because the long suffering of God. And because of his long suffering, they think that God has deferred his judgment. But now we find in our lesson today that God now, by his prophet Amos, presents to Israel the day of his wrath was not only just and certain, but it was on upon them. Now, we have to remember that at this time of the writing of Amos, that the kingdom of Israel, they had been divided. And that it was uh, uh, 10 tribes in the north, and it was 10 tribes in the south. Sometimes when we be reading scripture in the Old Testament, especially in the prophets, when we hear them referring to Israel, that many a times we have to look at the circumstances because they are not referring to the whole nation of the 12 tribes, but they are referring to the 10 tribes that were in the north, which had became within themselves and amongst themselves an independence of the two tribes in the south. But they were still God's people. God did not divide the kingdom. Man divided the kingdom. So now, and the kingdom was divided because of sin. So we see now that through the prophet Amos, God is speaking to the northern kingdom. And he now presents to Israel that the day of his wrath was not only just and certain, but it was come upon them that it had finally came. So we find in verses 1 and 2 of our lesson where it states, Thus have the Lord God shown unto me, and behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, A basket of summer fruit. Then said the Lord unto me, The end is come upon my people of Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. 
Behold, a basket of summer fruit. The approach of the threatened ruin or, or judgment is presented by a basket of summer fruit, which Amos saw in the vision. The Lord showed him that and Amos saw a basket of summer fruit gathered and ready to be eaten, which signified that they, the nation, the northern kingdom, that they was ripe for destruction and that and, and judgment was upon them. So the intent and the meaning of this vision is that the end has come upon my people. And I will not again pass by them anymore. God has become tired of pleading with his people. He has sent prophet after prophet, but they refused to hear the voices of the men that were sent for God. For God had long spared them and bore with them, but now his patience has ran out. So we see that God now is beginning to bring judgment upon his disobedient people. So we find in verses 3 where it states, And the song of the temple shall be howling in that day, said the Lord God. There shall be many dead bodies in every place, and they shall cast them forth with silence. And the songs of the temple shall be howling in that day. Now, we have to understand that it is not the songs sung by the Levites in the temple at Jerusalem is, is spoken of here. For this prophecy here concerned the northern ten tribes only. For in the north they had those songs in, which was in imitation of the songs that were sung in the temple at Jerusalem that they imitated those songs in the temple at Bethel and other idol temples which the northern kingdom had erected or the profane songs in the palaces of princes and nobles. Instead of the songs, there shall be hollering for the, the calamity that shall come upon them. We're told in the, that it says that there shall be many dead bodies in every place, in all houses and palaces, in all towns and cities, and especially in Samaria during the siege. Now we have to be mindful that the Assyrians that the Syrians, that they attacked the northern kingdom. God used the Syrians as a rod of correction against the northern people and that they laid siege to the city. And so that they laid siege to the city that the people could not come out. And so they was inside starving and dying from disease. And so now, we come to the part now, it says that that they shall be cast, they shall cast them forth with silence. Talked about the dead bodies. That they that had the job of burying the dead bodies should, should cast them to the grave without any funeral lamentations, without any Home going 
celebration for those who had died, but they would do this in silence. For one of them that cast them forth shall say to his companion, Be silence, and say not one word against God and his providence. And the reason why he said that because they was worthy of the judgment that was brought upon them. They should not say so because this was a judgment that is rightly and righteously that had came upon them. Or that they were to, to say nothing or the number of the dead least the heart of those that was besieged that was up under this attack that they would hear and should become tender and be discouraged and that they would become very fearful or that that they should be silent because the enemy could hear them carrying and, and, and having lamentations over the dead body and be encouraged to keep up their seeds. And so now we see that though that they had been in prosperity and they had been living good, God now tells them through his prophet Amos that the time is at hand and that they will surely fall in to judgment. So we see here in verses 4 through 6, we will recognize why the judgment of God is come upon the northern kingdom. Verse 4 says, Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, When will the new moon be gone, that we may sell corn, or the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the Ephraim small and the shankle great, and falsely the balance by the sea, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat. God explains to them the reason why they're coming in to judgment. Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy. God here is contending with the rich and the powerful men of the nation. They're the hideous sin they were guilty of is that they had the character of the unjust judge that is found in Luke, the 18th chapter, verse 2, where it states, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. The powerful and the wealthy and the nobles in the northern kingdom, they had no reverence for God. Though they claimed to be the people of God, but in their heart, there was no reverence for God. They put up a show and a form of godliness. They observed the Sabbaths and the new moons and the feast days they put some difference between those days and the other days. They made a difference. But they were very soon weary of them, and they had in their heart no affection for them at all for them because their heart was wholly set upon the world and the things of it. We as part of the body of Christ, we are told in the third chapter of Colossians, 
verses 1 and 2 that if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on, on things above and not on things of the earth. So we see that the people, the nobles, the wealthy, the powerful, the movers and shakers in Amos' time, that they were weary of those seven days and the new moon. They were days where all trade and commerce had to be suspended. And so they were weary of them. Though they had to observe them, their heart was not in it because they were fun. They were of the market days. They longed to be selling corn or setting forth wheat. They were growing wealthy and wealthy, and this is where their hearts and their mind was at, that where they were eager where to go and consume early wealth. But look at the character and the behavior of these people that God is, is bringing judgment upon. He says that they cheated those they dealt with. When they would sell their coin, they cheated the buyer, both in giving out the goods and in receiving the money for them. They measured the coin by their own measures and pretended to give the agreed amount. We see so much uh, uh, corrupt business practices in our society today where where it's just greed where where uh large investors and companies and and businesses where they just take a advantage of the consumer those who cannot defend and those who are in need those who do not have the financial backing where they can defend themselves so they even today, they take advantage of those who are in need. We see that that when they receive the buyer's money, they weighed it on crooked scales. They weighed their money at that time. And so instead of them using an honest and a balanced scale, they use a crooked scale. For instance, if they the price was a hundred shankles, they would fix their scales where it where it appeared that the scales was weighing a hundred shankles, but it really was a hundred and fifty. And so they were defrauding the the people. And that and that with their crooked scales, they made the shank was so great so that the money being found too light must be more added to it. And so they cheated this way too. In another instance of their fraudulent dealings is that they would sell the refuge of the wheat and taking advantage of their neighbors. Ignorance or necessity and would make them take it at the same price at which they sold the finest of wheat. In our, in our society today, we see it so often that with these uh, uh, loan companies, these title loan companies, these payday loan companies, these, these different uh, uh, financial institutes, these mortgages companies where where they take advantage of people who who are in financial need where their credit might not be squeaky clean as others' credit. So they charge them a more exuberant interest rate than they charge 
the so-called people with the squeaky clean credit. And so a person who is already in need and is already desperate has no choice but to but to say I mean but to accept those high interest rates. We find these used car dealers, used car dealers where people the poor come to them. They sell them knowingly, purposely, derelict cars that they know will not hold up. They they take advantage of the needs of the poor people. And so here we find that they was doing the same thing in Israel. And that even when they sold them the wheat, they would also sell them and mix in that some of the, the, the refuse from the wheat, from the 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 stalks and and the hulls of the grain and mix it in there with the wheat to make it way more. Where really they had less wheat, good wheat, mixed with a lot of the refuse from the wheat. Sometimes in these supermarkets that we find in the in the black neighborhood, they they take the meat that they are selling, the so-called hamburgers that they are selling to the poor with these meat packages that you find so much fat mixed in with the lean that that by the time they get to cooking a hamburger, they, they, they have a skillet full of water. So, so these practices that was done then, they are still doing them today, that, that they are taking advantage of those who are in need. It says that they swallowed up the poor by making them hard bargains and cheating them in those bargains. By such wicked practices as these men show a greediness of the world, such a love of themselves and such a content of mankind in general and of the sacred laws and justice of God and prove and disprove them in to have in their hearts neither the fear nor the love of that God who has so plainly said in Leviticus 19 and 36 saying, just balances, just weights, a just Ephraim and a just hen shall you have. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe all my statutes and all my judgments and to do them I am the Lord. So many times we get hung up on the Ten Commandments that that Moses received on the tablets of stone. But we have to understand this, that, that God gave the nation Israel no, like no other nation. He gave them laws, and the laws was not just the Ten Commandments. He gave them laws for their religious worship for, for them. He gave them laws, statutes, and precepts for their civil life or, or dealing with one another. And he also gave them laws for this personal hygiene. And so God precepts and his laws are to be obeyed. But here they, because they had no regard for, for God, and so they had no regard for their fellow man. Though he was poor and he was one of them, but they despised them. And, and, and so they took advantage of him and, and they would 
swallowed them up because there was no love. There was no love whatsoever. They did not love God, nor did they love their fellow man. So we find in verses 9 and 10 of our lesson, lesson where it goes on uh, to state, And it shall come to pass in that day, said the Lord God, I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. And I will turn your feasts into mourning, and all your songs into lamentation. And I will bring up sac sackcloth upon all lawns, and baldness upon every head. And I will make it as the morning of an only son, and the end thereof as a bitter day. The Lord spoke to Amos and said that, and it shall come to pass in that day. This is an assurity that this day will come. And, and this is God speaking and God going to stand on his word that he will bring divine judgment upon the northern kingdom. And that judgment is described here. Just as the wicked overturn the moral laws of God, so will the Lord with his judgment break through the order of nature. He will cause the sun to go down at noon and envelop the earth in darkness on a clear day. This applies to a nation when it is suddenly destroyed in the midst of his earthly prosperity. America, we need to be mindful of this. Though at that time, the Northern Kingdom, they was prospering and everyone was seen to be doing well. We as people in, here in the United States, we think because of the prosperity or the so-called wealth that this nation has that God is pleased with us. We'll say that 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 uh, 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 God God bless America. That that this is God's country. No, this is not only God's country, but the Bible teaches us that that the world. The whole earth is the Lord, and the fullness thereof, and all they that dwell therein. Israel had the misconception because they was God's people, that that, and God blessed them and protect them, that they could live any kind of way that they wanted to, and we here are up under the same delusional reasoning is that yes this is God's country America was built on Christian principles God no it wasn't America was, was, was built on force and terror so and, and we lied and, and, and hid behind the things of God for our co corruption and so that we could murder and, and 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 privilege and rape the whole world. So we have to be careful about that. See, because just like the Northern Kingdom was in the midst of their prosperity, they thought that they was being blessed by God. But God's judgment comes upon man when he think not. Even in the midst of wealth and prosperity, they will be stricken down. 
And so we have to understand it. So God through his prophet Amos is telling them that that all your singing gonna be turned to holly. Though though you have your feast days and your and you celebrate your uh, Sabbaths, but your heart is far from it. That that you are tired of it and you be glad when it's over so that you can go back to your scheming and conniving against your fellow man. Taking advantage of those who are weaker financially and, and, and whose station in, in life might be a little lower. And so we do the same thing here. We have to be careful. And so God tells him that that judgment going to come, that the sun going to go down at new day. And so it would be also when the Lord Jesus come in judgment at a time when the world in its self-security look not for him. Where is this Jesus? Where y'all y'all been talking about this Jesus coming back? Where is this Jesus? Ain't ain't I, where is he at? He ain't came back. It, it's been two or three thousand years. Where is he at? Things are still going on as the same. But when the judgment shall but bust forth on Israel, then all the joyous feasts will give way to mourning. And lamentation. This morning will be very deep, like the morning of the death for an only son, like losing your and grieved by losing your only son, your one and only son. It will be a day of bitter calamity and a bitter wailing and mourning. In the bitterness of their spirits, though the beginning of the day was bright and clear, yet the end of it dark and bitter, distressing and sorrowful. They would take off those fine silk robes and then they would dressed himself in sackcloth and ashes. They would pull out their hair because of their grief, because of the the death of their loved ones, their families. And and that day, in the midst of the day, when the sun should be brightest, it would suddenly turn dark. And so we see that that God judgment comes upon sin. Yes, God is long-suffering, but God will and he has to judge sin. Why? Because God is holy. Look at the picture of God's judgment of sin. That picture can be clearly seen if we look at the crucified Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. For he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. God's only son that God said, in whom I am well pleased. But picture him broken and battered on the cross. The Romans did not kill him. The Jews did not kill him. Jesus said, no man take my life. He laid his life down because it was the will of God. He was smitten of God. Why? For the sins of mankind. And so God, in his mercy made a way for all mankind to escape their judgment. But just as God has sent his prophets 
Time and time and time again to the northern and the southern kingdom, the people refuse to hear. They refuse to listen. Because why? Because God was long-suffering and judgment did not immediately come upon them. But don't you know that one day the world will be done. That, that the Lord would say that I am so done with you, mankind, that judgment will come upon the earth. First, second Peter, excuse me, second Peter chapter three, verses three and four states, knowing this first, that there should come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. But we find in that same third chapter, Second Peter, where verse 9 says that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is, is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, that all should come, to repentance. And that word repentance is that that we all should come to a change, a attitude, a change of mind, and a change of heart towards God and towards sin. So let us not be like the northern kingdom that though they celebrated the, the feast days and though they went through the motions, let us not be where we cheat and defraud our brothers that who are all at a disadvantage because God will judge his people. So as he said to the nation Israel, to the, the northern kingdom, I am so done with you, we have to be aware. We have to be aware because God is not slack. God is just willing. He's not willing that any should perish. So let us keep this in mind that even, even we as Christians with our individual life, let us confess our sins. Let us confess our sins, and then yield to the Holy Spirit, and then let the blood of Jesus Christ cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For just as God judged the nation Israel, God will also judge his children. Not for salvation, but for our Christian walk. We will not lose our salvation, but we will receive chastisement from our Heavenly Father. So let us confess our sins and let the blood of Jesus cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May the Lord bless you and keep you.